Well, if you look at, look at a tree or if you look at any green plant, it's like a counterbalance for us. Because we breathe in oxygen and we breathe out carbon dioxide, whereas a plant, a green living plant, breathes in carbon dioxide and breathes out oxygen. So they do an enormous balancing act for the very atmosphere in which we live. But the deep-rooted woody plants, like trees, if you have a big spreading tree, its root system will be about as big under the ground. So they are also cycling, they're part of the water cycle. So they bring up water from deep in the ground and they transpire water into the air. So they close the cycle of what brings rain. So we need the living earth, the living cover of the earth, to maintain the cycles of water and nutrients that we depend upon. It's, it's fundamental, primary. But I think the landscape of Australia has taught us some quite hard lessons too, because the whole continent of Australia has many small and some larger rivers, but that enormous Murray-Darling Basin system that drains out in the Coorong in South Australia, that river has taught us the importance of managing salt in the landscape, because where we cleared trees off large areas of land, we ended up with rising salt water, which came up and poisoned the land. So we've learned the lessons that we need to maintain trees in the landscape, and we need to maintain water flows in the big rivers in order to flush out the salt into the sea and keep the salt level in the water so that plants can survive. So the concern at the moment is what they call human-induced climate change. So there's been climate variability forever. There, there's been variations of droughts and floods, and they have oscillated around a kind of a mean, you know, a, a level. And because humans have become clever and industrialized, we've become very dependent upon energy, and our primary sources of energy have become coal, gas, um, and the issue with that is the mining of it can cause damage in the area where the mining takes place. But it's the burning of that by very large populations, like the city of Adelaide, the city of Sydney, the city of Mumbai, New Delhi. What we're doing is we are burning complex carbohydrates in coal and in oil that formed thousands of years ago from ancient plants that have been compressed under the surface of the earth. And we're burning them very quickly and they're releasing some of the most potent greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane, and other carbon monoxide and other gases. And they are now being released into the, air. Into the atmosphere yeah. and creating, like they call it the greenhouse effect, because it's as if there's a blanket over the earth and the amount of fossil fuels we're burning is putting this layer, which is trapping the heat. It's like being in midsummer, but putting, putting a thermal blanket over the top of you and you overheat, you become too hot. But global warming and climate change isn't just about heat, but it's a destabilization of what have been the natural ebb and flow of things. So you'll find Really what we're seeing now is that we're beginning to live through what was predicted. And the prediction was that if we kept emitting greenhouse gases, we would be seeing an increased frequency and intensity of extreme events. So when you look around the world and you look at the floods in Pakistan, you look at the recent bushfires in America, Canada, here, it's that they're coming more often and each time they're breaking records. When we as Australians, we live in Oceania, so our nearest neighbours in the Pacific and in our own Torres Strait Islands, on the one hand, they're terribly vulnerable to climate change because many small island atolls are metres rise in sea level mm. from the melting of glaciers. With a warmer climate, glaciers are melting more quickly. Yeah. That is raising the sea level. And so the island 
life is completely threatened yeah. and the beginning of deep sea mining for communities that are very dependent on fishing and catching sea life has potential to do great damage to the ecosystem of the environment around their islands. So how we take that climate change, global warming is the same word or is different definition for both of them? Climate change has become more used these days because the impacts we're seeing are not just about warming. So you're seeing increased freak snowstorms, sudden snap, crazy weather events. It's this destabilization which is characteristic of climate change. Yeah. I'm just thinking when you're answering this question, I was thinking the water was on a really high level at one stage in, in past any stage. Yeah. That means there was time earlier at any stage when the sea level was up. Yes. So if we think from the other way, it's a natural process. How we can change it as a human being? Those indeed did take place. But if, if you look at the age of the fossil creatures that you uncover and you look at the speed at which these changes took place, they were gradual. So you're going back to the original land bridge. You're going back to this being part of Pangaea when Australia, Papua New Guinea, this was all one land mass. With a, with a land bridge, you know, like when yes. when Aboriginal people first came here, wow. after the humans first came through, yeah, through the Middle East. So that's different to changes we're seeing in one lifetime. It's just the speed and the extent is different. What we should do? What, 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 what we should do now? More recently, I've been working in an interfaith space, working with Multi-Faith Association of South Australia, and religions for peace. And really at the core of most faiths is that humanity was put here on earth to care for each other and to care for Mother Earth. From all religions. From all religions. This is like a responsibility for humans on earth. So there's great hope to be found if we live up to that part of our responsibility. And if you take the word responsibility, it's the ability to respond. So we have a changing situation. So what is in our ability to change? So we can change, I can change what I do, and that's only small. We can change what we can do, and that's a bit bigger. And then we can influence the governments we vote into power, and they can make decisions about what the country does. And the countries can go to the UN and sign climate agreements and make promises and they can work towards trying to keep those promises. So where we are standing, are we doing good as a government, as a representation of our country, or we, uh, from efforts-wise, we are still under question? So I think there have been great strides and great efforts being made. Mm -hmm. I think our own South Australian government, both Liberal and Labour, because it began under Liberal government, yep. they have been moving the state of South Australia very swiftly to pick up renewable energy. So I mentioned briefly earlier to you, there's an article in the Manufacturing Industry magazine, which is talking about South Australia's capacity to reach 100% renewable with solar and wind, with battery and other storage capacity, which would be a world first. Because some of the other countries that are making a big swing to 100% renewable, they also have a lot of water. They have big rivers and they have um, hydropower. And we're the driest state and the driest continent. We don't have hydropower, but we have wind and we have sun. But at the same time, we're still going ahead as a country with new coal-fired power stations. No, not power stations, but the mines, three new coal mines and also new opportunities for fracking for gas. Yeah. So I guess my sense is we are at a time in history when we can't pretend the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. So we're doing good on renewables, but we're still doing fossil fuels. So that's why we need as a community to say, it's time, let's stop opening up new 
coal mines and new gas plants. And let's focus on bringing everybody into the renewable energy revolution. So, as a community, as a Punjabis, as a Indians, where we are standing, what do you think? Of I think, firstly, we must look at our founder, Guru Nanak. Guru Nanak. Guru Nanak had a farm, and that was also, that will help in the environment. So, when we look at what where our roots are, and most of us are farmers, you can see the importance of climate change. You see, so that is why, and we all must work together to contribute towards improving the environment. Climate change is not only in Australia, it is not only in the problem, it is a world globe, di. and we have to issue it. Fix it. We are going to be clean, and we will have 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 Basically, we have to aware our dear friends and committee members that we are aware that we have discussed that we have to make our generation properties, we have to make our generation some savings. So, I think we have to see our generation as a good environment. We have to see our plants. This is this was the discussions uh, in the papers or uh, on on the media. Um, so the Australia trying to introduce. Uh, e, how you take that? So personally, I am against, mm -hmm. and I think because when I think of with the balance between human and nature, there are some things that we let out into the atmosphere we can't put back in. Mm -hmm. And so radioactive materials are one example. So it's interesting when you look at where uranium lies in the Australian landscape. The First Nations, the Aboriginal mm -hmm. Torres Strait Islander nations who lived there, they said, don't go there, it's sickness country. Don't disturb those com that country. And when Australia has mined and exported uranium and it's gone to France to power nuclear reactors, and then we have the waste coming back. And it's been 20 or 30 years that they've been trying to find a community that is willing to take the radioactive waste. And one of the issues with finding a dump for putting radioactive waste is that the duration of its radioactivity is most likely going to outlive the duration of our languages. Yeah. So how even can we put up a warning sign? Mm. Because we don't know what would be living here in that many hundred thousand years in the future. So I take it as a serious kind of responsibility to heed some of those warnings. Mm. So the country like a, uh, China or India, uh, the holding biggest population in the world, yeah. how they will fulfill their uh, uh, you know, energy needs. Yeah. So if they don't have nuclear plants. To them, they have already got nuclear and they're dependent upon nuclear and it's likely that that will be in the mix for quite some time. So one of the things is to think about transition plans. So in a transition plan, you look at where you are, you look at where you could be, and you look at the pathway, because you can't just jump from here to there. You've got to have a transition plan that can help you move across without turning the lights off, as they say, you know. So um, the efforts from last 20, more than 20 years, you're putting in to, to aware the people through through your campaigns, uh, how where you reached? I mean, how? Well, I'm a very small part of a much bigger thing, which is called the Australian population. And because I primarily I'm um, an Anglican by heritage, but a Buddhist by practice since I was eight, 18 years old. And one way or another, after being an agricultural scientist, I now work with a multi-faith association, which is why I know Balbiji here. Um, and there is the Australian religious response to climate change, and that's been running now for a number of years. And they had a recent campaign, which was hashtag Faiths for Climate. Faiths for Climate. Faiths for Climate. And uh, there was a 10 days from the 14th of September to the 24th of September, where faith communities around Australia put up banners on their places of worship. 
and Guru Nanak Baba. Yes, good one. Yeah, yeah, put up a banner put too. Up yeah, and and I think from memory, the banner that was up at the Gurdwara was protect creation, support a fossil fuel treaty. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so this is where I was saying there is this non-proliferation treaty on fossil fuels, and that has a you know, they call it a landing page when you can sign a petition. So faith communities can sign the petition as members of a faith or just as a member of the community. They can add their name to say, okay, we'll, we'll support this. And so that really went well in Adelaide. This year we had a lot of communities in the electorate of Boothby. We had um, Catholic and Anglican and different churches we, we had the Gurdwara, we had Marian Mosque. Mm. So many different faith communities came together just for the simple action of supporting action on climate change with a banner. So that in itself doesn't change the climate, but it changes awareness. So maybe it's something we can all do a little bit towards. I think for the children, very important is for them to have say we have a talk with the children and also get a feedback from the children what they think, how they can do to improve the environment. Now, in Australia now, they are realizing that the First Nation people had the right idea about environment. Now, when they had these floods and they had the bushfires, especially the bushfires, they've now gone to to get the uh, ideas from the First Nation people because in their days they did not have this much of bushfires. How to control the bushfires and how to look after the environment. And if you look at their history, they have, for thousands of years they have been looking after the environment. I mean, they haven't had this much of disasters as we are having now. And we realize it is all because of climate change and the environment. You set up, I respect to the Ghana people, the land uh, who are the original people, you know, that's a national statement we always heard when we start, you know, but the environmental issue is not national, it's international state, you know. So when the whole, can, all countries sitting together, are they not able to create a kind of statement which is compulsory into any program, which is uh, really connected with any government statement. So can be added like one sentence, which can circulate uh, that more fast. So when you when you come to the level of dealing with 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 governments and with countries, you know, like as a global whole, then we have two, uh, at least two. So one is uh, UNFCCC, which is the United Nations Framework Agreement on Climate Change. So that, that, that's the group that gets countries together that made a commitment in Paris. I went to the Paris Climate Talks in 2016, 15. And the whole reason for that dialogue and agreement was for countries to make commitments mm-hmm. to reduce their emissions so we could keep global warming under 1.5. And that was brought to us by the young people. It was actually the young Australians, Aboriginal mm-hmm young fellow and a couple of others were part of the youth delegation and the youth delegation started this campaign 1.5 to stay alive and that influenced the outcome in Paris so the agreement was that we would try all collectively as governments to keep emissions below we have a window so slim it looks likely we will overshoot but even if we could keep it below two, that would be a great benefit. So that's the climate change agreements. And what governments do is their um, country contributions for that. And the other is the Biodiversity Convention, which is about the protection of the living world. Because they need to come hand in hand. We need to protect the ecology, the diversity in the ecology that brings resilience into landscapes. Thank you, Flipper. Thanks no, for your time. We enjoyed you that talk. I hope everyone Thank you for listening. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you, Robbie, for inviting us all. Thank here. you. Thank you, Robbie, for all, doing all this for the community. We all appreciate it. Thank you.